Joining me now on the Knicks Film School podcast, um, he is the only man in history to take an A seed to the NBA Finals. Uh, winning seasons in 10 of his 11 campaigns as head coach, four times coached a team to 50 wins, and he is in the top 50 all time amongst NBA head coaches in wins, win percentage, and of course, playoff wins. More important than any of that, if you ask any Knicks fan who they think of when they hear the words Knicks head coach, if they're between the ages of 25 and 55, his face is going to show up in their mind. Um, welcome to the show, Jeff Van Gundy. Well, thanks for having me. It, absolute pleasure uh, and an honor uh, for someone who, um, like many Knicks fans in the city, grew up uh, rooting for the teams that you coached and kind of um, learning what it was to be a Knicks fan uh, based on uh, how you led those teams and and what you did and what you were able to accomplish. Um so I want to kind of get right into it because, you know, you, it's very it's interesting to talk to you because you you have this place in New York lore. But at the same time, you're one of the best um, basketball minds analyzing the sport today. And uh, when I was just thinking about, you know, what you're best known for um, the whole run here, but I think the 99 team holds a special place. And, you know, we're coming off this very magical season 2021 here with obviously Tom and what he was able to accomplish winning coach of the year, Julius Randall, the whole group. Uh, I'm curious if as you were watching, and I know you pay close attention to the team still, you saw, saw some similarities maybe between what they did last year and, you know, that kind of out of the blue 99 season. Not, you know, obviously there's some differences, but I'm curious if, if those two things ever clicked for you. Well, it really didn't because I think, um, the difference is the 99 team was uh, uh, a, a, a talented team that for many reasons started off slowly, you know, Ewing's injuries, Spreewell's injury, a lot of change, whatever it may be. Right. I thought what the Knicks did great last year, you know, and I, and uh, Tom Thibodeau and Andy Greer are two of my best friends. So I watch, you know, every game that I can, I, I thought they, they, got more out of their team on over the course of the 72 games uh, than anybody else. I, I thought I give credit to the players and to the coaches because they came to play. They played with energy. They played tremendous defense on a marginally talented offensive team. Like, um, you know, they shot the three so much better than I think anybody could have expected or hoped. And I just think like, their achievements in the regular season, unfortunately, set them up for um, disappointment in the playoffs because then everybody's locked in. And Atlanta had so much more, you know, offensive uh, gifts than the Knicks team did. You know, so uh, by seed, it was an upset. But by sure. talent, it's really what it should have happened. Uh, I'm actually just hearing you talk about that. I'm wondering if really the, the maybe the better way to phrase it was if last year was kind of like the inverse of 99, because I'm wondering, do you I mean, Miami certainly didn't take you lightly in 99 because you had been through the wars and they knew what they were getting into and talk about throwing seed out the window. It you know, it was Miami and New York, whereas, you know, last season, the expectations, at least nationally for the Knicks. I think a lot of people picked them over Atlanta. Um, I, I'm wondering back back when you went on that run, did, how did expectations after, like you said, a down regular season play into the success of that playoff team or, or did it not play in at all, do you think? Well, I think what happened um, in 99 was um, I think Spreewell played the first game. You, you could check this, but I think then he missed. That was 50 games, so then he missed yeah. 13, right? Straight, I think. He had a stress fracture. So, uh, and then Ewing was sort of in and out all year. You know, he just never felt right. And, we, you know, I screwed some things up early, I think. Uh, I think some players were playing below whatever their uh, talent level was. But we had a win in Miami, I think, that galvanized us. We were down uh, big early. We came back. We won. And that propelled us the rest of the regular season and we played well. And I think if that 50 game season had been a normal 82 game season, we would have been in that, you know, 
45 to 50 win range. Um, and so for Miami, unfortunately, yeah. uh, they got a team that was just as good as them. And they knew that. I mean, that wasn't like there was any major secrets. They had some real strengths. We had some strengths. And, um, you know, fortunately for us, you know, we were able to prevail, um, you know, on the road uh, in a game, you know, deciding game. And I just think like, you know, I think that's where the talent level was even like, um, even Indiana, when we played them, um, like they had more talent than we did, but we didn't have, you know, because we had been in the playoffs and had success, um, there wasn't a like where we felt like we were, you know, not as good or couldn't overcome whatever cropped up. I mean, we had a, a veteran, tough minded, talented team. And so I think what, the Knicks of last year had was an inexperienced playoff team uh, that, you know, if you don't have enough offensive talent, particularly off the dribble, it's really hard to score in the playoffs. And, you know, so some guys who played and had tremendous regular seasons, you know, their playoff efficiency, starting with Randall, yep. you know, went down. And, and so that's what they've got to try to figure out. You know, and I, I don't want any Nick fan, if they are a lower seed this year than they were last year, to think think of that as regression. I think they made, like, they jumped far above their weight class last year um, in seed than their talent would indicate. And so I, I would expect that with the Eastern Conference being a little bit better, um, you know, and the Knicks had great health last year as well. Yes. You know, I just think, you know, as Nick fans, which we all are, <laughs> we have to make sure we don't think because they were four seed last sure. year. Sure. Yeah. We're going to move up to third or second. You know, I mean, that's they got to get more talent. And you nailed it. Um, and you, you're, you're consistent about this. Anytime you talk about, you know, this, it, it, it ultimately, you know, comes down to it comes down to the talent. Um, I almost came on here and said the greatest coach in Nick's history, but I knew you'd fight me on that. I didn't. However, yeah, you didn't get to coach five. Future, you, you, you didn't get to coach five, five future Hall of Famers. Well, Monroe came later for, for red, um, but you did but have me, a great, let me say this though. And I, yeah. I love the, the whole Hall of Fame with coaches. Like, uh, yeah, it, it sort of drives me crazy. Right. Because like, I, I was thinking a lot about coming on your, your show today and, you know, when you're, when you're going to go and talk about the Knicks, you start thinking about, um, you know, those times and even the people that came before you. Sure. And the one thing I loved about Red Holtzman, and he was a consultant when I was an assistant yeah. there, uh, and even at the start of my head coaching, what I loved about him is he was so humble. He knew that great players make great coaches, yeah. not the other way around. It's not. Um, there are a lot of Hall of Fame players in every sport who didn't have, quote, the greatest coaches of sure. all time. But there are no co coaches in any Hall of Fame that don't have their name attached to great players. It just, you know, great players make great coaches, not the other way around. And I think Red, mentioning them, the humility that he had about that, um, is something I was always drawn to. And you are, I mean, there's so many ways that you are the quintessential, um, you, you are the soul of the city and, and how you go about your business and how you talk about um, past, present. Um, and that's just, your humility is one of the many things. I, I am I am curious because, you know, Tom, as you already alluded to, got so much out of that group. Um, perhaps, uh, and I'm, I'm wondering, is there a part when you're a coach and you get to, and again, I don't know maybe if you did any of this before the 99 playoff run, if you get to go to your guys and say, nobody thinks anything of us. And Tom could literally point to the over under, and I don't know if he did before, of, for, before the season and say, they're picking us last, not last in the division, not last in the conference, last in the whole league. Do, can you, can, do you utilize that, um, when you have it? I think. Those type of motivations are very short term. 
Okay. Before an individual game, I think, you know, at, you know, if you pick your spots, right, you can use something to up the level of intensity for an individual game. But overall, I think what teams become is number one, their habits, whatever your habits are. And I think the Knicks had really good habits last year. Um, defensively, I think they played to their strengths offensively. Like I said, I thought they shot the ball well. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think the second thing is, um, you have to find self-motivated players. There are no, there's not 82 games of Newt Rockney speeches to try to drive (laughs) and elicit a response. If you need that, you got the wrong guys. Okay. I think what an undersold part of their success last year was Leon Rose having a longstanding relationship with Tom and allowing Tom to be Tom um, and coach in the manner in which he's had all this success. You see so many times now where whoever hires the coach in any sport tries to cherry pick and say, yeah, I like these qualities, um, but I don't like these. And I'm going to try to change this guy. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't work. When you hire somebody, you have to let them work and you have to let them coach with confidence. Just like we say players have to play with confidence. There are so many management people now that suck the confidence out of coaches. Um, And I think what Leon Rose did brilliantly last year, because I think he has an appreciation for how hard coaching is. Sure. And he has an appreciation for how much time Tom and his staff invest in trying to be the best they can. Is he let him coach to his personality? And he wasn't saying, hey, don't yell so much at the referees on the (laughs) sideline. And, oh, you're being, you know, you're you're calling out defensive coverage is too loud and you look too gruff and, you know, like sowing the seeds of doubt, which so many people do now. Yeah. Right. And so because Leon uh, willingly took a step back to let Tom be along with Randall, the face of the franchise, I think people are missing out on so many things that Leon and Tom did so well together. Um, You talk about synergy. It's hard to create. It's hard to keep in New York. Um, And I think. Why is that in New York specifically? Because it does seem harder here to have sustained success. You know, it shouldn't be. Uh, (laughs) It shouldn't be. But in a perfect world. (laughs) But I think what happens a lot of times, unfortunately, is people start to run towards credit and run away from responsibility and blame. And when I, and I don't, I don't say that's just one. I mean, it's all factions, unfortunately. Um, And I think what you have to do as a coach is what, or what you want is the ability to coach your team uh, in the best way you see fit. Um, Now, so many of these, they, they actually want to be co-coaches without the responsibility of the results and, and tell you who to play, how to play, when to play, when to practice. No, you're playing them too many minutes. Leon didn't get involved in any of that. Like not one time did you, did you hear him say mumble, um, you know, Randall played 38 minutes last night or, you know, and guess what? If they don't play those minutes, guess where you see your Knicks. Not winning. Not in the playoffs. Yeah. Nope. I, and I, so yeah. I, I loved the way they worked together last year. And I, I, I think they should both take a bow um, because I'm sure they didn't like always agree with everything the other did, but they acknowledged like how good each, each one is at their job and let each other do their jobs and hats off to them for that. Well, you, you talk about trust and I, I wonder how much of trust is trusting that even though the, the person is not doing the thing that if it was you, you'd be doing being big enough, really, if I think is what you're saying to step back and say, okay, you know, I, it's, it's not what I would do here, but 
there's there's the trust factor and it's going to go longer than if I step in. And I'm, you know, I'm just listening to you talk about that. And, and can I make, say something on please, that? Please, yeah. Yeah. And, and acknowledging that the other guy is more of an expert than you are <laughs> in that area, in that area. Yes. So, yeah. So Tom studies coaching as much as anyone has ever studied coaching. Like, <laughs> like, you know, he's not only a brilliant coach, but he could go through seriously. If you asked him a Belichickian question about the 60 Celtics, he could give you the history of <laughs> the league. You know, like he's that type of like yeah. mind. Well, I wonder where he got it from. But. Yeah. And then I think, <laughs> and then I think Tom, even though he might like, and I, I don't have a specific example because, you know, I don't really speak to him about that stuff. Um, I'm sure he, he, he had some example that he could say, yeah, I don't agree with either bringing that guy in, letting that guy go, drafting this, whatever it may be, right? Sure, yeah. But acknowledging that's that man's responsibility, and that's what he's been studying <laughs> since he's took over. And I think the acknowledgement of where your expertise lies and where it doesn't lie is critical in, in maintaining uh, a harmony and a trust. What happens oftentimes now is there's certain management people and certain coaches that think they have um, great knowledge on everything, even outside of their, you know, area their, of expertise. Their purview, so sure. That to me is where so many of these conflicts, unfortunately, come in. I I wonder, you know, you you mentioned buy-in before that that Tom got that buy-in it, it doesn't it have to go hand in hand with with players seeing that he has been given the longest leash that he like it's it's your it's your it's your job go go and do it um as opposed to i wonder sometimes in certain situations around the nba where you have these teams that maybe you know and, and look let's just call it like it is for a long time it was the knicks who don't achieve success it, do you think it's because players see that that trust does not exist and that, well, if the guy up top doesn't trust the, the person who's telling me what to do, why should I listen to the person who's telling me what to do? Well, I think the first reason teams fail <laughs> is because they're not, they don't have good enough play. It's not good. That's yes. why, <laughs> yeah. And that's why the person, the most important person in a franchise um, isn't, is the owner because the owner is going to select whoever's in charge of picking the players. Yeah. And then that guy is the second most important person in the, in the franchise because who picks the players is that's going to determine the trajectory of a, a team. And then, you know, then they're, everybody's important, but so what I'm, what I'm saying is I, but once you have like, you know, talent that's in the ballpark, mm -hmm whether you achieve more than maybe people expect or less, I think a lot of it is what you just said. Like, do we trust him when he doesn't do things the way that I would? And the biggest example in the next that I can remember is when Phil Jackson took over, <laughs> it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't the triangle, yeah. um, that couldn't work. First of all, they didn't have good enough players. No. Um, but like he should have like coached the team, like mm. because he he had very specific thoughts on how they should play, right? And um, I just think it's really hard to coach well when you can't coach to whatever you think is you know, the right way to play, whether it's pl playing certain players, um, whether playing style, um, rotation of 9, 10, 8, 7, 11, whatever it may be. Um, and, th and that's what's so different now about coaching in the NBA. I got to say, when I, I worked both in New York and in Houston, there wasn't unanimity about everything I ever did right from above me, like without question. And, and 
And they would come to me and tell me that, right? It's not like they wouldn't discuss it, but at sure. in the end of the day, you were allowed to coach to your beliefs because what's impossible coaching in the NBA is when players know, uh, like you mentioned before, that there's not a trust and that you're sort of a, not a puppet, but like you're yeah. not controlling the shots. And then secondarily, that you don't believe in, in necessarily what you're doing. In what you're doing. Well, you know, like it just doesn't work. You, you know, on that note, uh, I would argue that you walked into a, a, a couple of, I have to ask a couple of things about the old days before I let you go. You, had, you knew I was going to, you walked into as difficult a situation as there was um, putting aside the fact that you didn't have a healthy team when you took over in um, the 95, 96 season. I, I looked it up. I couldn't believe it. I thought I was misreading. You had to start Herb Williams alongside Patrick Ewing in your first game. The only time they ever started a game together because you didn't have Oak. You, you know, we, we, that was still a stupid decision. <laughs> No, I should have started J.R. Reed. I still kick myself. Well, you, you changed that at the next game. Yeah. Reed, I, Reed, I, yeah. I, I just woke up in the morning and Ernie knocked on my door and say, you're coaching the team tonight. And I'm like, okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, like I had a maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe an hour and a half before shoot around. The good uh -huh. part is I, I did all the scouting reports back then and all the, yes. you know, walkthroughs. So I was ready from a presentation standpoint. Okay. But – I mean, come on, man. What a stupid decision that was. <laughs> and that's not that unheard. Like, no, no, of course not. Two centers, right? Yeah. Um, so I should have started J.R. Reed. And I, I think the next game we played the Bulls, I think. Well, that's when. I think we, I think we did start J.R. Reed. Did we not in that game? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it uh, led to a 32-point win over what many people still consider the greatest team of all time. I'll say this. That bus ride from Philadelphia back to uh, New York. Mm-hmm. That's back when we didn't charter, like, from, like, I don't even know why we chartered to Philly uh, now. But, you know, so anyway, we took a bus, and uh, I was, like, sitting there saying to myself the whole way back, you know, I may never win a game. Because Philly, <laughs> Philly was awful. They were, they were, like, 10 or – they had, like, a, a low window. They, no, they were awful. Like, and you yeah. know what's funny? You know who was on that staff? Who? Thibodeau. Oh my goodness. That's right. John Lucas, Ron Adams. I mean, what a, they had a great coaching staff and an awful team. So, <laughs> um, yeah. And, um, yeah, so that it was very, uh, that's what's humbling about coaching though. Sure, right. Yeah. Like, you know, you can lose to a, a terrible team and then you can beat an all time great team. And, and you know, like, I was so fortunate. Sometimes you're not fortunate when you take over a team being the assistant and moving into a head coaching job because, you know, things can be, things can get murky. You know, you're like sure. as a head coach, your responsibilities have changed. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, people can't adjust to the changes, either coaches or players. Right. And so I had such great guys, right. They weren't easy, but they were great competitors. And I, I think like, I was so blessed when you have a, a hall of famer uh, like Patrick, right. Mm -hmm. He covers up so many mistakes that you make as a young coach um, because he's just so good that after the game, the only one that knows that you made the mistakes and got away with it is yourself, your staff, their, their head coach and their staff. Right. Okay. And it's like, that's what happens. But I had great competitors. I, you know, you mentioned uh, Patrick Oakley was out, but a great competitor. Uh, yeah. Mason, uh, God bless his soul, yeah. um, an amazing competitor. Starks, Harper, Ward. Like, we weren't super talented at that point on the perimeter as far as, you know, that's why we went out and Ernie got Ernie and Dave got. Um, Alan and Chris. And, uh, and yeah. Yeah. And, and so we added to that and Larry John, you know, all those great moves that came uh, about. But. At that point, like what I did have, man, I had an all-time great in Patrick and I had all-time great, great competitors.
Um, you've been so generous with your time. Thank you. Last one before I let you go. Um, you mentioned Patrick. Um, you mentioned the talent that you, you the team went out and got um, after you were uh, eliminated, you know, that that first season. Um, and the series against, you know, I think about your career. What if Patrick hadn't gotten hurt in 99? What if you had just one healthy season with Yao and Tracy together, which again, we don't have to, you know, I'll save that for some uh, Houston podcast, I guess. But I think a lot of Knicks fans still think of the 90, the night. And I know you said the 92, 93 team, I think was the most talented, but the, the 96, 97 team um, and the suspensions, I, I went back and I was looking over old box scores. You guys were up in the middle of that fourth quarter. And then Miami, and this is back in the days for any of our younger listeners, when you could go a whole game without hitting five three-pointers. And they had five three-pointers in six minutes, the last of which was by Alonzo freaking Morning. No, no, that's the one. See, you have Nick knowledge that, that you know that Morning hit the back-breaking three. Yeah. Is, see, that's what people, they don't really know when they like think back. He hit one all year. One. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was from the top of the key. And I'll tell you this, though. It was a loss, it, and then we got, unfortunately, pounded. And I'm not sure what we had, you know, left going down there. Um, but it was a – it was a – that was a high, high-level team that we had. And we were really good. I mean, really good. And Allen was playing at a terrific level, yep. and he gave us something that we had never had. And if we had it in, you know, 90 – Anywhere in that, uh, in the Pat Riley years. Sure. I think we're a championship team. Like even, even having to play the bulls, because again, going back to those teams, same with the Knicks last year, if you can't go off the dribble yep. and get your own shot, that's why I don't buy in all this, you know, the mid range is, is not important. It is in the playoffs. You've got to yes. be able to get, uh, uh, your own shot. Look uh, at the finals last year. The Suns were Devin Booker, Chris Paul. I mean, he's, he's no. You need it. You you can't just say we're gonna we're gonna stay behind the three and we're gonna shoot layups. Like you don't get layups against great defensive no. teams, you know. And great defensive teams don't foul a lot either. So anyway, the point is is like that was a great team. It was still a. a I. I what boggles my mind is, and this is not sour grapes. This is actual, no. like unbiased. The, uh, the you know to suspend Charlie Ward, John Wallace, all those guys who came on the floor. That's our fault as as coaches and as players. We deserve what we got. Sure. To s- suspend Patrick yes. was vengeful. He did nothing. He took one step on the floor and looked. Uh, that, that's. It, I don't know why they they took like perverse pride in Thanks. doing that, but they did, and uh, it was it was unfortunate. But um, you know, I, I'll always say this about Ewing um, and that group: we did not win a championship, but they competed as yeah. champions, um, both practice preparation in games. There was very few times as as the coach of that group um, or as assistant coach uh, previous to that, that I ever thought like, you know what? The fans got cheated today. They didn't bring it. That doesn't mean we always played well or won, but they they played to a standard uh, that there was great level of pride, just like it, it, it shows in how, how deeply you cared. And when I look over your left shoulder and see, go New York, go New York, go, there was yeah. never a better song ever created nope. in-house than that. I was talking to Steve Kerr about, <laughs> we were at the Olympics together um, this year. You know, he was an assistant coach. I was a scout yeah. for the Olympic team. Yep. And that song came up. Oh because, my goodness. Yes, because there was no song in the fourth quarter that was ever played that elicited such response. Like it was like, it's still, if I ever, when I ever hear it, it, it makes the, the hair on my arm stand up. It was that electric. You're, you're not the only one. Um, 
I'll just end by saying you, you guys, um, you're champions in the hearts of uh, anyone who was lucky enough to watch you. And that was that's that. And I'll just add that's before the last 20 years. We I, I'd like to think that, you know, people may have had their quibbles, but I, I could speak for myself and everybody I know. We appreciated it in the moment. And um, God, we loved you then. And we love you now. And uh, I just on behalf of the fan base, because they'll get angry at me if I don't say it. Uh, thank you just for being you. And uh, again, embodying the spirit of the city and just giving us something to be proud of, not only then, but even to this day that you're still, you know, you're the face of the NBA in a lot of ways alongside, um, you know, Mike, Mike Breen. Um, I mean, when you turn on a game, it's like, if it's a big game, who are you going to see? You're going to see Mike Breen and Jeff Van Gundy. And the fact that you guys are both Knicks, um, it's just, I can't describe that level of pride. And uh, so just on behalf of everybody. I got a question for you. Sure. Do you consider Mark Jackson a pacer or a Nick? You want the honest answer? Yeah, no, honest. A uh, pacer. He'll yeah, always be a too. pacer. Yeah, me too. The shimmy, I wonder, he, he, he I wonder was, what he considers himself, though. That's That would be interesting for me. But I, I would suspect he would consider himself a pacer. He, when you take that level of pride in the shimmy, he knew the dagger was going in every time he did that. And he, it seemed like he enjoyed it. Maybe he didn't, but it sure seems like he, he enjoyed it when he got to you know when he would do that airplane. Oh my God. Right. I, I said, I say to him all the time, there were so many times he'd be flying that airplane and I would just like to like smack him. <laughs> like, and as much as I liked him from when I was an assistant coach and, and I loved him and I, <laughs> you know, you know, just a great man. And what a career he's had. Yes, but, of course. You know, like I just, those Pacer games, you know, that I, we talk often and I, I know we're running long, but like no, it's fine. that, that four, those four teams in that time of the Eastern conference. Oh my goodness. Pacers, Bulls and Knicks, man, like Tom, you should get Tom talking about that. He has a story oh, I'd love to. about <laughs> Jerry Tarkanian. Right. Who he, Who he was an assistant under at San Antonio. At San Antonio, like his first games. assistant job. Yeah. 20 games. Right. Mm-hmm. So anyway, they stayed close. And when the summer league was in Vegas, when we'd go out there, Tom would arrange. So we'd eat dinner with uh, uh, Coach Tarkanian. And he would always talk about when it was those like series. He, because it was the West Coast, say the yeah. game was starting 7.30 here, 4.30 out in Vegas. He would get his TV tray and set it up early before the game, get an early dinner set right in front of him, and just sit back and watch because he enjoyed it so much. So he would tell Tom that. So, like, when I'd go out there, he had better recall. Tark, Tark had better recall the game sometimes than I did. You know, like, it was like <laughs> – but anyway, like – the coaching and like, think about it. It was uh, Larry Brown yep. early with the Pacers, right? Yep. And, you know, and then Larry Bird. Larry Bird, pretty good coach. Right? Uh, coach Jackson, who's like, you know, forget his Nick time, but like, I, mean, I, I still don't think he's ever gotten uh, the credit he deserves as a, as a coach. I, I, I thought he was brilliant. You know, everybody talks triangle, but I thought defensively he got those guys – to play, um, you know, and then, um, you know, Coach Riley in Miami. Like, mm. Tom always said, you better bring it in those games as a coach and as a player or you're going to get your ass whipped. And, and he's so he, – he was so right. And it was like it – was, it, was, it was such great competition. So it wasn't just in the playoffs. I just – Yeah. Um, it was – yeah, it was great. And um, I think good times are ahead for the Knicks now. I'm – I'm so happy for Tom. Um, it's been his dream. I remember when I when he was working uh, as an assistant with the Knicks in the '90s. His parents would and and brothers brothers would often train down from New Britain, Connecticut, all the way to the Garden for a game, and then train all the way home. I mean, this is a diehard Nick guy from birth to to be able to lead your team. Um, and like he did last year, win coach of the year, man, I'm pumped. I'm all in on these Knicks. Um, 
I, I'm all in on Tom. Um, and uh, again, just one more time, uh, all in on you. You're just, you. you're absolutely a legend. You're just, I, 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 I could sit here and talk about this obviously for a long time, but you have things to do a uh, season to get to his media day. Um, and, uh, yeah, thanks so much for your time and, and thank you for everything that you've done. Anytime. Take care. Appreciate it, Jeff. Be well. Bye-bye.